being here. If people feel comfortable, if you could move up a little closer. Um, our, non, our non-violent activists and resistance folks up here, it feels good to have people a little closer to them than so far away. So if you can move up closer, they'd love to have you closer up. And I'm going to hand it over to Oriel Eisner, who's going to moderate our panel for us today. Thank you so much for coming. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's great to see you. You can't hear me? Is that better? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to the Opportunities and Challenges for Palestinian Nonviolent Resistance panel. Uh, my name is Oriel Eisner. I'm the U.S. based director of the Center for Jewish Nonviolence. I'm also moderating today's discussion and very honored and grateful to be here with inspiring activists and leaders who are doing this work day in and day out. Um, before we begin, invite everyone to silence your cell phones if you need to and uh, get ready for the panel to make sure we're not interrupted. Toward the end of the session, I'll ask questions, so save your questions for then. I'll make an announcement about that. Issa, unfortunately, has to leave us early, so I'll remind us, but as we get toward the end of the panel, if you do have questions specifically for Issa, we'll invite those first. Um, and before we begin, I want to invite Jeremy Benami to say a few words about Sid Topol and the Topol Foundation who are sponsoring this panel. Um, I invite Sid to say a few words as well. Thank you so much. I wanted to stop by for one minute to honor my dear, dear friend and role model, Sid Topol. Sid is the moral compass by which this organization and all that he touches is guided. Sid is a passionate, passionate advocate for nonviolence. And there is probably no one in this country who has done more to further the study of nonviolence and to promote its practice. And so it is an honor for J Street to have Sid on our board. It is incredible, Sid, that you are not only sponsoring this panel, but you sponsor so much else in this country and around the world to promote the use of nonviolence to find human rights and dignity and democracy. It's my honor to turn the microphone over to you to introduce this panel. Thank you, Sid. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you. I actually, no, 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 I, I can't move. Can you hear me? Okay. I actually don't have to say anything because Jeremy covered everything. But let me tell you about my introduction to nonviolence theory and practice. Years ago, when I worked for Raytheon Company, I refused to work on military equipment. I, be I became a pioneer in satellite communications and cable television instead. I only worked with the military to create satellite equipment that could be used for defense. Eventually, I retired and began providing scholarships and fellowships to young people. Then I met a certain professor, Linda Trope, at UMass Amherst, who was exploring nonviolent solutions to conflict from a psychological point of view and not from a political science point of view. I was so excited by her work that I began supporting her research when I realized then that there was a whole academic field promoting the power of nonviolence to prevent and resolve conflicts and resist oppression. I began supporting that work wherever I could, aim to make a real mark. Through our foundation, a family foundation, of a member of which is here, my daughter, Joanne. Uh, we fund scholarships and fellowships studying and promoting nonviolent solutions at Tufts Fletcher, at Brandeis Hillel, at Harvard Carr Center for Human Rights in the Kennedy School, at the University of Haifa, and my two alma maters, Boston Latin School and UMass Amherst. Over the years, I've come to believe deeply what I think I knew a little bit back and during my time at Raytheon. 
Most conflicts have no military solution. Most wars resolve nothing in the long run and only make things worse. Now we have proof of this for those who want to read the book. The power of nonviolent resistance has been documented by great scholars like Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, the authors, the authors of Why Civil Resistance Works which meticulously records the significant sustainable success of nonviolent solutions to conflict and the failures of violent attempts to end conflicts. So here we are. I'm delighted that J Street has recognized how important this work is and devoted a whole panel to it. I want to thank Oriel, Issa, Sama, and Susan for coming. And I'm so sorry that Suleiman Khatib couldn't be with us he couldn't get a visa, which is an indication of what the problem is. It is, the work here is directly, my, our work is directly aligned with J Street's mission to promote peace and diplomacy, and I'm thrilled to help bring some awareness today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sid, and thank you personally and to the foundation for sponsoring this panel, for making it possible to have this conversation. Uh, I think it's a vital conversation. I'm very grateful for all of you for being here. Um, as Sid mentions, Suleiman Khatib was unable, his visa was delayed, and he was unable to join us today. Um, a quick note, he's involved with an organization called Combatants for Peace, former Israeli and Palestinian fighters who are now engaged in nonviolent civil resistance to end the occupation. Yeah, round of applause is worthy. If you'd like to learn more about that organization, find out more. They have a table outside. Um, as the title of the panel suggests, we're here to discuss both opportunities and challenges for nonviolent resistance, Palestinian nonviolent resistance. Um, I personally have had the honor of standing with some of our panelists and other Palestinian nonviolent leaders in on the ground nonviolent resistance in the occupied territories through the work that I do with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence. Um, and in that work, I've seen and felt the breathtaking power, inspiration, opportunity, and challenge of nonviolent resistance to bring about a just future for all in Israel and Palestine and an end to the occupation. Um, I'm honored to be in this conversation. As I said before, excited to, to turn it to you, and I'll leave, leave most of the talking to you and then a chance for the audience to join in. Um, a quick note just to frame the panel a bit more. As Sid mentioned, in recent years, there's been increasing research into the significance and impact of nonviolent resistance. And particularly as our panelists can speak to, there are unique opportunities and potentials on the ground. Um, attracting support from citizenry, building up civic society, joining in resistance efforts that draw public attention to the harms that are committed and to possibilities for alternative futures. In the interest of time, I'll invite you to read the bios of our speakers rather than saying much um, right now in front of all of you. But what I will say is that we have an incredible wealth and breadth of experience and knowledge here that the three of you bring, Samach, Isa, and Susan, in various work on the ground in Israel and Palestine. Um, it's a privilege to hear from you. We all are privileged to be hearing from you and those who are joining us on the live stream. Um, with that, our first round of questions. So, opportunities and challenges. There are many. There are more than an hour's worth of conversation can have for us. But let's start with opportunities and see where we get. And Susan, I'll start with you. Um, you, for the last five years, have been engaged in nonviolent curriculum development and teaching in schools in East Jerusalem. You also, in recent years, have joined with Tahir, um, a Palestinian nonviolent movement in consulting, visioning, strategic work. Um, I'd love from your experience to hear a bit about the work, if you could say more for all of us. And then if you could speak to some of the opportunities that you see in the current situation and through, through the work that you've done. Thank you. I just want to clarify. Okay, is this better? Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you to the J Street youth, the students, the college students that are here. This is my first um, J Street conference that I've come to. And living in East Jerusalem for the last five years, the kind of conversations that I'm, he I'm hearing here just 
lifts my soul and it gives me hope. And I just want to say thank you for this next generation. The, those of you that are here, we're here because of the work that you've done, but then for this next generation that's talking about how can we come together and how can we change the conversation. So thank you so much. I was sitting with a group of Embodying Peace yesterday, last night and their compassion and empathy told me, and they're American Jews, and they're, the compassion and empathy and support that they are wanting to listen and hear has made a huge difference. And it's something that encourages me that I'm going to be able to share with all of my Palestinian friends and colleagues in both East Jerusalem as well as in the West Bank. So I want to start by saying thank you there. Um, my involvement with Tahir started with at the school that I've been working at for the last five years as we were doing a Peace Heroes curriculum, and our students learn about peace heroes from around the world. So they're learning history through the eyes of peace. And they're not only hearing about these amazing men and women who've changed the course of history through their stories, but they learn about Palestinian and Israeli peace heroes. One of the peace heroes is Ali Abu Awad, and that's how, that was my connection to Tavir. I heard what he was saying. I, I had invited him to speak at our school. He spoke in Israeli <coughs> schools. I've been with them there. And then I started hearing about what Tagir is doing. And I went, okay, what is it that they're doing that's at the grassroots here that's making a positive difference? And I realized that they are a nonprofit organization and they are leading a Palestinian national nonviolent movement. And when I heard that, and they're working, they're doing that at the grassroots. I just thought, okay, I need to learn more about this. At that point, I was invited to come in and do strategic planning with them, helping them refine. They had a vision, they had mission, they had some values, but everything was just needed to, we needed to up the ante, get clarity on a lot of those things. And so this past summer, I went in and we worked on that. So I'm just gonna share with you the vision of Tahir so that you can get the big picture this is where they want to be, to achieve a peaceful solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that guarantees independence, freedom, dignity, and a secure life for all. Now notice they didn't give the solution in their vision. And then their mission, this is what they do. We are a movement that creates social and political change by transcending victimhood and practicing the values of good citizenship with integrity. We embrace nonviolence as a unifying identity for the Palestinian people and adopt it as a means to end the occupation. And that's pretty clear. So then as we got, uh, we identified those and got real clarity on the vision and the mission, then I said, okay, how are you going to act? What is your behavior? What is your values? And how you are going to accomplish this mission? And they came up with seven things that I want to share because it's, a very, it's not very often that I see organizations that articulate it in the way that they have. The first one was having integrity. And so I said, okay, define having integrity. They said being trustworthy, honest, keeping our word, acting in the interest of the movement versus self. So it's easy to move into an organization and start getting self-focused versus the movement focus. Being respectful to self and others in their words and in actions. And you'll see that all of this is congruent with nonviolence resistance. Being responsible, being organized, being committed, staying true to the vision and the mission, which meant keeping focused and being responsive. They're some of the first responders on the ground when anything happens. Many different groups or families, organizations, when something comes up or settlers move into an area, they call them immediately and they're some of the first responders there. 
And being sorry to interrupt, but again, in the interest of time, because we did start yes. a little bit late, I'm curious, in just a couple of minutes, could you talk about some of the opportunities that you've seen sure. in, in sure. enacting this Thank vision you. and putting it into practice? A lot of the opportunities that they have is through the messengers of change. The messengers of change are the carriers of the movement on the ground. And these are women leaders that they've identified, and they take initiatives, they go into the communities, they talk about what are the issues there, then based on once they've looked at all of the issues, they say, okay, why are some of these issues going on? Then they come up with solutions to those issues. So then the, the women take responsibility, and they also do youth empowerment and through the leadership there. But I'll let some other people, and we'll come back to some other things later. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, Isa. You have years of experience practicing nonviolent resistance and leading campaigns in occupied Hebron in a highly militarized, highly surveilled environment, and through that have had enormous successes and been a part of many campaigns. I'd love if you could share a bit about that work, about the work that you're doing, and also um, what sort of opportunities you see, what the current environment makes possible. Uh, uh, first of all, I am very happy to be with you here today. Uh, I hope that you uh, understand more about the Palestinian nonviolence resistance. We are not the representatives or the only representatives of the Palestinian nonviolence resistance. We have many uh, brothers and sisters are working hard on the ground and they are not uh, allowed to leave Palestine or leave Gaza or leave Jerusalem to come and be here in the uh, United States. Uh, and uh, they are doing an amazing work on the ground and I really appreciate their work. Two days ago, around 25 uh, Palestinian, Israeli, and international activists were detained and beaten during a, a protest, peaceful protest in the Jordan Valley against the annexation plan. I mentioned this uh, protest because direct action is one of the best solution to end uh, any kind of uh, annexation or occupation. I believe a lot in direct action and grassroots uh, movement. You don't hear about this kind of actions. We have weekly protests uh, in West Bank, uh, resisting the wall, resisting the settlement, asking to end the Israeli occupation. We have weekly protests on the borders of Gaza. I don't know if you know about it or no. The right of return, weekly peaceful protest in Gaza where the Israeli snipers every week they injure uh, many, many Palestinians there and many Palestinian paramedics, Palestinian journalists were injured or they were killed by the Israeli uh, soldiers. And the right of return marches, you know, I was very happy and moved that we have this kind of marches at the borders to make changes because staying silent doesn't make any change. You didn't hear about the anti-metal uh, detectors uh, at the Al-Aqsa Mosque protests. Thousands and thousands of the Palestinians were protesting peacefully, praying in the streets, and they were attacked, arrested, ill-treated by the Israeli officials without any real uh, awareness or the media coverage was almost zero. So one of the main things I do, I try to integrate, engage the media to the nonviolence resistance. I try to increase awareness about the importance of using nonviolence resistance, civil disobedience. I'm indicted by the Israeli military in the military court, and one of the main charges is calling to civil disobedience. Because under the Israeli military law, we are, as Palestinians, are not allowed to have any kind of general assembly. Peaceful protesting is illegal according to the Israeli military law. We are not equal with our Israeli partners or with the Israeli settlers who are living in the same area where we live in Hebron with 22 checkpoints, 100 movement barriers, 1,800 shops closed by the closure policy, 1,000 Palestinian apartments became empty because of the closure policy. We are not equal with the Israeli settlers who are attacking us, who are very violent, who are the follower of Ma'ir Kahana and Kah movement. I was attacked many times physically, this year maybe eight times without any kind of accountability for the Israeli settlers who are attacking us. The settlers, they are, you know, they have the privilege for impunity for many reasons. One, because they are under the Israeli military law, under the Israeli civil law, 
and because there is no law enforcement will from the Israeli right-wing government to make them accountable. This is something very important to address about the Palestinian non-violence resistance challenges. One of the main challenges, arrest charges. You know, this year I am with you. I'm coming to the end to my ongoing trial since three years. I will be convicted for sure because it's a military law. So maybe next year I will be jail and jail and I may spend two to three years in jail for protesting peacefully the occupation. The second thing which is very important to, to address that they target the international activists. Many American Jews were denied from coming to Palestine because their support to the nonviolence resistance, and one of them is Ariel Gold here, and many other, you know, international American Jewish activists, they fear to talk about occupation. They fear to support us as Palestinian activists. They fear to say no to the occupation because of the anti BDS laws here in the United States and in, uh, in, in, in Israel. We, as Palestinians, we chose the nonviolence resistance all forms of nonviolence resistance. So we are asking you to support all forms of nonviolence resistance, especially the ones which is making the occupation costly, which is making the occupation more expensive, which is making the Israeli settlements more expensive. We see a lot of money coming, on, uh, coming from the, the, the American uh, community, the American government, $3.8 billion is going to Israel. On the other hand, USAID was closed for the Palestinians. The humanitarian aid was cut, but the military aid to Israel, it's not to Israel, it's to the occupation. So we want J Street to have a real stand, as Bernie Sanders said one hour ago, that it must be a conditional fund and donation, and even to change it to be a humanitarian fund to the people in Gaza who don't have any clean water to drink. I think soon it will be all polluted. It's around 90-something percent. So a lot of opportunities and challenges, but the main challenge is that we don't have that support and recognition from many American officials, because to have a nonviolence resistance, as what Martin Luther King did in the past, we need a real support from you here and from all over the world, the media, to post our activities, to post our actions, to talk about us, to talk about that we are targeted, that the majority of the Palestinian human rights defenders are arrested, detained, beaten. I get a lot of physical attacks. I get a lot of death threats. I have nightmares. I don't sleep because of the occupation. Because of me, I chose to lose nonviolence resistance. So please be critical about how you support the Palestinian nonviolence resistance. And we say it, we have a lot of Palestinians come to Palestine, come to, to Hebron and see by your eyes what is the occupation. The main enemy of everybody in this room is the occupation. We don't want any other fight with BDS with, uh, or any other groups who are really to the left and they are trying to make changes. We should be all united against the occupation. About uh, opportunities, a lot of opportunities. My first visit to the US was 2011. I was an official guest in the State Department. I was completely disappointed. I said, I will not come back to this country. It's not my country to come to talk to. I didn't, I didn't find any real support as a Palestinian activist talking about my rights. But then I came back 2015, 16. I, I saw a lot of you here. I saw many uh, activists in the United States are doing an amazing work. Look to if not now what they are doing to the, you know, to the Jewish Center for Nonviolence, what they are doing here, and they, what they are doing back home. You know, I remember 2016, we, this is why they started going after me on the court. We organized, imagine, organized something small, a protest to start a, a community cinema in Hebron. Is that something you don't like? It's the only community cinema in Hebron. We were attacked, arrested, detained. Then I was indicted. And one of the main friends of mine, who I, got, I, I made his friendship, was Peter Beinert. He moved a lot from that time from, you know, to see that action happening on the ground and they, how the occupation you know, attacked us. So we have a lot of opportunities with you here, with many American people, with many American Jewish activists, and we are winning. 
they want the elders, with all respect to the elders here, we are winning the new generation. This is where we should work. This is what I am doing in Hebron. I'm working with my community hard to mobilize them to civil disobedience. And my dream is not to end the occupation, by the way. My dream is to have a real Palestinian nonviolence movement, which means that we have very strong Palestinian civil society, which means we will move from occupation to democracy and human rights. I don't want to move from occupation to another dictatorships. This is what I want, as he said. Thank you, Issa. Um, Samach, you, uh, you live in Neve Shalom, Wachat al Salam, uh, what many may look to as a vision of what the future could look like. Um, a few months ago, you hosted a nonviolence conference there. You've been a part of many civic society protests, demonstrations in Tel Aviv and other places. I'm curious if, from your experience, you can speak to, again, share some of, of what you do, the work that you do in Neve Shalom and other places, and also what opportunities you see for nonviolence today. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, for being here after the big, uh, you know, VIP speakers in the next door or upstairs. So uh, um, uh, I really appreciate and uh, thank you, Seth, for um, for being with us and supporting this uh, um, movement of nonviolence in Israel Palestine. I live in Wahd Salam Nabi Shalom for the last 20 years. Uh, Wahd al-Salam Nabi Shalom is the only intentionally shared society um, which means Palestinian and Israeli families choose to leave their original places and uh, kibbutzim and cities, villages and leave their family, extended family and for the Palestinians is a big issue and live with the neighbors, with, with the others, with the uh, uh, potential enemies, and we uh, this this amazing community um, uh, exists for the last 40 years. So uh, we are now 70 families. The four uh, founders, families who founded this uh, place, uh, uh, became now 70, and we have huge waiting list and uh, for people from both sides who want to apply and come to live with us. That's give me hope and, and big opportunity that um, we are not the small, you know, lunatic crazy people who believe in this model and peace. That means that people believe that they need something different, different agenda. So I, I can translate, you know, um, I can start any debate. And I, uh, for feminist, radical activists, believe me, I like to debate. And, uh, <laughs> So I, when, when we talk about nonviolence and the peace movement in, in Israel, Palestine, and um, I really enjoy to answer like when, when people ask me about if peace possible, like I live this thing for the last 20 years, I know that it is possible and if you want to know how to do it with nonviolence tools, I can be your girl. I will teach you, I will <laughs> help you. So if you're questioning if, if it's possible, the answer is yes. If you want really to be to dare and to uh, be brave and to try different way and to be courage, uh, I, I, will, I will be on board. And I'm not the only person. I, we have a, a great partners around the world and inside Israel, Palestine. So why nonviolent? Action. Why to choose nonviolent way? First of all, you spoke here about the youth and and um, you know generational issue. Nonviolence is not generational issue. I met here 30 minutes ago a great activist that I didn't met before, and she was arrested uh, at age 83, right, <laughs> and at the prison because she fight with the non-violent action, the, we, the um, weapon industry here and the non-clear weapon industry here in the U.S. And she, 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 she was in jail for 25 months because she believed in something and she believed that she had to fight. It's not generational issue. In the non-violent action, there is place for everyone, from children to old people to youth, students, and yes, women. women in the non-violence action, we have a place because we don't like to fight, if you noticed. 
usually we are the victims of violence against uh, you know gender based violence which is something that really concerned me in the last 20 years and i i became very active fighting gender based violence in the in our movement I, i'm talking now uh, the palestinian women inside the israeli society fighting gender based violence we don't want to fight. We don't like this violence. And the only tool that we have to develop is nonviolent action. So we protest, we speak, we advocate, we, we organize the victims, and we uh, started to be out there. Our voice has to be heard, and uh, we organize the, the families, the mothers, and uh, we train them to speak up in Hebrew and in, uh, in English and in Arabic in the media. So the tools are, are unlimited, but the uh, belief that that you can make change with nonviolence tools, this is very, very important. The third thing that uh, nonviolence action is much cheaper than war. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, Israel in the last, you know, 70 years did not stop to produce weapons to this world. No weapon factory or, or, you know, has been closed in Israel. The military um, uh, economics is blooming and, and it's ongoing and weapons and arms and tanks and drivers and you know bullets produce violence in our world and we have to fight that and the only way that I know as a feminist as peace educator is the nonviolent action and the third thing that fourth thing that I like about nonviolent action and speaking about Arab citizen in Israel, is this method and this struggle, it's not only including everyone, including women and youth and old people, it's, only, it's also a confusing the enemy. A, because they don't know what to do with us. <laughs> we are nonviolent. They can't, you, you can't find, you know, find your enemy if you, if you want peace. You know, what, what they want to say for this cinema, in, uh, community cinema in Hebron, that, you know, you can't see movies anymore, like we will, you know, sometimes they do, but it can't stand for the long term. You can't fight, you know, fight someone who wrote something in Facebook. Israel put in jail a point, Darin uh, Tatur, she, she wrote something on Facebook and they punished her, tracked her down and it was really, really awful, forbid anyone to read her words. But she, like after a struggle and the nonviolent support uh, and movement to support her, she was released from the jail. You know, it's, it's cost money sometimes, it's cost energy, it's cost long-term, you know, determination that this is what we are going to do. And sometimes it's being outside and it's cold and raining and I, it's, we will be there. But the truth, you know, in the, in the end of that journey, she went. The, her freedom of speech went. Now we are campaigning uh, from here, from everywhere, to release Hibal Labadi. She, she was activist and she visited her family in Jenin and she's arrested now for, and she's, she's uh, have a hunger strike for the, about a month and she's in real danger. And we saw what's, what's the, the opportunity for Jewish activists, peace activists, gender uh, and feminist activists to collaborate together to release this young lady that she did not, didn't do anything you know, against the Israeli army. So nonviolence action is confusing and the, and the people who believe in power and believe in weapon and believe in violent, violence can't, you know, can't resist. For the long term, we will win, believe me. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Issa has to leave in about 10 minutes, so I and I want to make sure we want to get to time for some Q&A. So if you do have questions for Issa, I invite you to go to the microphone so that you have a chance to ask those. I'll ask one quick question as folks are noting, and if you can answer in maybe one minute, let's try. Um, what is one thing that is, there are opportunities, you spoke to many examples of nonviolence, but there are also, of course, challenges and, and barriers in the way. So what is one thing needed to strengthen nonviolence or one thing that will bring um, 
Issa, you look ready to answer, so I'll, I'll let you go. I won't ask the follow. Uh, you know, increase our price as a human rights defender and nonviolence activist by recognition and by support here in the United States, because the U.S. The US have, ha, has a huge influence on Israel. So please, you know, we want you to recognize us, recognize our right to use peaceful resistance against the Israeli occupation. The, the question is, what is one thing that is needed to strengthen uh, opportunities for Palestinian nonviolent resistance? I would probably say on the ground, which, which would be different than here, but on the ground is all of the organizations working together. So there's so many nonprofits, so many organizations that are working towards reconciliation and peace and all of that, but everyone is a silo. I shouldn't say everyone, but many of them are silos. And one of the things that I noticed in the five years of living there is everybody's working independently. And I wanna say, how can we all bring our resources together how can we look at this as one uni united body and work towards um, this Palestinian nonviolent resistance? I, I do agree with that uh, um, because the, the nonviolence movement is not a movement. It's, it's initiatives and projects and, and small organization here and there who's doing amazing, amazing things. But the, we don't really feel yet the collective impact, like we, uh, I think that, that the next step, and this is what we do in, in, in our uh, conference, we gather people who are, uh, want to learn more about the nonviolence action against the occupation, and uh, 42 organizations signed uh, to that conference, hundreds of activists came uh, to learn from each other and to learn how to collaborate. This is the next step. So we, we in, he, in this um, conference, we heard a lot about, you know, uh, facing the occupation and the peace process and shared society when we talk about the uh, Palestinians inside Israel. But I think that the next step, if we really, we, this is the need for, from my point of view, is shared struggles. We, we have so many things to share. We have so many struggles to share and we have so many values to fight for. And we can't afford this, you know, um, um, small initiative here and there. We have to be, uh, uh, you know, as a collective, uh, a, a group of people who uh, make, even if it's fake, you know, the, 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 the this this uh, atmosphere that we we have we have something to say that's why i'm as a feminist for example i'm really concerned for what happened to the haridian women and why they are cannot uh, be elected to the knesset what uh, when i uh, when we protest as the palestinians against the national state law we really wanted to speak uh, with uh, in rabin with the, with the jewish uh, activist because this is also uh, putting them in in the in front of that uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, you know, racist, bad uh, a bill that the uh, Israeli government uh, voted for. When we face the police with, uh, with you know, um, here, I don't know if you uh, noticed that, but in the audience when, when Barak uh, speak, we, nobody, no Arab uh, participant were because uh, were there because we we couldn't participate w with the panel with the crime uh, crime minister prime minister and he is a crime minister who killed civilians who killed citizens 13 uh, citizens who were uh, peacefully protesting so uh, the non-violence action have to be uh, enhanced and pushed to be together and the next step is to uh, train ourselves and shrink our ego and be together in the shared struggle and, uh, and, and be organized. And this is something that's really needed with, with, the, with what's happening in, in the region regarding Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you. Yeah, turning to our audience, and again, short on time, Issa, I think you have five minutes now, so if we can keep the questions concise and direct, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So all through this conference, we've been talking about how the main goal that we all have is that everybody, Palestinian, Jewish, Israelis, live in equality and freedom and dignity. But it seems that I'm hearing that there's two different tracks. One is the one for national independence for the Palestinians. And the other seems to be the fight for what will be civil rights 
for Palestinians even within or under the Israeli authority. And my question is, do you see within the Palestinian community these different tracks? Are these in opposition to each other? And what do you think of those uh, suggestions that because of the two-state solution seems to be so difficult that for 70 years we cannot do it, that the Palestinians should focus more on the civil rights approach within the current uh, authorities? Go ahead. So this is a question for Isa. Uh, I had uh, the, uh, really the privilege to be in uh, Hebron with you in 2010, and uh, I'm really in awe of all the strengths that you have to be able to continue this struggle over the years with all the threats uh, and on your life uh, and also going to jail so many times. And uh, I, I know that many, many other uh, nonviolent activists are going through that, and also their children, because oftentimes it's their children, teenagers yeah, do you, who are... Do you have a question that you yes. want to ask? Yeah. So I wanted to know, in, you are asking our help, and of course we can help you financially, and, but what else can we help in terms of, with all the trauma that you're going through, uh, to be there with, for you and to, and also you know, uh, l l also learn from you because a lot of persons here now, we also are kind of PTSD with the Trump administration, but it's nothing, the trauma that we have compared to your trauma. So this is my question is about healing trauma okay. and how we can help. Do you want to take one more? I don't know if they want to ask me a question because I will answer like this. Yeah, so maybe answer these two and we'll see wh where we're at with time. So You know, asking for civil rights is something, you know, a little bit somewhere else. We want equal rights. We want freedom. We want dignity. We want self-determination for all. So if somebody tells me to have a civil rights, I want civil rights, but I want full political rights. I believe that we are all equal. That is how it should, should, the resolution should be resolved. If we believe in one state solution or two state solution, it's not the time to talk about that. Now it's a time to resist the occupation, the, to resist the injustice, and to resist the inequality. The occupation now is too strong, and we should make the occupation weaker altogether. The one-stater, the two-staters, any people believe in human rights. Human rights is very important, but Palestinians are humans, and they should be equal with all of you. So don't think about the right wing trying to say Palestinians, they want, they are saying that we want to live or prosperity for peace. No, we don't compromise the food with dignity at all. This is something very important and you should know it. And if you hear voices here or there, they are just not representing the Palestinian people. About what you can do. You know why I'm leaving you here now? I'm meeting somebody in the Congress, a Congress member. You all have connection in the Congress. You, have, you all have connection in the media. You all have connection in your communities. Please organize actions, activities. Increase the awareness. Join the groups who are really resisting the occupation here in the United States and who are increasing the cost of the occupation. This is how you can make the change. We can't make the change to say that, oh, yeah, okay, we support peace. Okay, then what? The right wing, they are supporting building more and so more settlements, and they are creating facts on the ground, and they are changing everything on the ground. And we hear some people saying, okay, I'm, I'm supporting two-state solution. No, it's one-state solution. Now it's an apartheid. It's not one state, it's not two states, it's an apartheid. This is what is happening on the ground, and let's work all together to make the changes. Media. We are not posted in the media. We are not there in the media. Maybe I'm the most Palestinian in the American media because I, I write in the foreword, I write sometimes here or there. We want more Palestinian voices regardless of their opinion in the media. That is the freedom of speech. Let's hear all the Palestinians. Let's hear more Palestinian voices. Invite Palestinians to your synagogues, to your, to your mosques, to your churches, your communities, and hear the Palestinians, what they want. Give them more space to talk. In this conference, I don't see many Palestinians, despite that this year it's the maximum number and it's a huge participation. 
But I, we want more Palestinians to be engaged. I don't want somebody to talk on my behalf. Many, they are talking, Isa, you want that? Well, who says that? We want, we can speak, we can talk, we can express and represent ourselves well. The Palestinians, they are the most, the, you know, they are the most people who have PhD per capita. So we are really educated and we invest a lot in our human development index. But unfortunately, the occupation is destroying any kind of opportunity for making the change. And prosperity for peace, I recommend that you all read Sarah Roy book. Sarah Roy is a Jewish scholar. It, she describes that it's the development. The occupation, you can't have a real development with occupation. It's the development. So how we can make a real development, you can talk to the Congress. You can help. You can talk to the next, I hope, next uh, president here. Uh, the new one, you know, uh, you know, Mr. 45 you should not be here anymore, you know, in the United States for destroying the American politics inside and outside. One minute left. We have to go. Uh, it's okay to be late uh, for five minutes there, but you know. You have to react like seeing uh, uh, Arab man, angry Arab man next to me with his hand like this. I also don't worry, don't worry. I know. I, see. <laughs> I have feelings. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving the stage for both of you. You know, go to Twitter, go to social media, tweet, write, show us your support, be active. Don't feel disappointed, we need you. You know, when you write, we feel more supported. When you say loud, we feel more supported on the ground. When we see a photo of not now protesting someone who's really blindfully supporting the occupation, we feel supported. So our feeling, you know, are boosted and we can do more on the ground and we can challenge, confront the occupation peacefully more with your support. So we need you and you are doing well in spite that they are winning a little bit, but the time will come that we will get equality for everybody here in the United States, in Saudi Arabia and in Palestine and all over the world. This is my message to you. Thank you, Isa. Thank you for joining us today. Samah and Susan, would you like to also answer those questions? Maybe I should take a few questions. Because, uh, and I, I would be happy if you, you know, introduce yourself. Can I just add one more thing to what he said in terms of things that you can do here on the ground? One of the things that I would do is, and I have done this, is meet, have smaller meetings in your home. Invite your friends to come and share a movie, tell a story and create a conversation around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and just say, let's talk about what's going on in the world and let's think through this and just offer opportunities for people at the grassroots here at home to talk about that. I just wanted to add that to what else we can do here. Thank you. Go ahead. First time I ever changed my clothes to ask a question. Um, Lisa. You know, follow me in social media, I can answer all of you. Yeah, no. <laughs> I was glad to see him. Uh, I was wondering if you could, um, uh, I guess, Oriel, to elaborate a bit about uh, the Center for Jewish Nonviolence, uh, because it is an opportunity for people here in the United States <laughs> to be working on the ground doing resistance in uh, the Palestinian occupied territories. And, um, uh, I know there are a number of other CGNB people here as well, so people should know that they can, besides going to Congress, actually go to the occupied territories. I'll, I'll quickly answer that and then we'll take a, a couple more questions. That's so. funny that they yeah. give the moderator a uh, question. Like not that Does that feel okay? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Um, in, in a few words, I'll just say that uh, the Center for Jewish Nonviolence coordinates delegations to join with Palestinian and Israeli grassroots activists on the ground um, in nonviolent resistance work and solidarity projects. And we also have a table outside. We have people in the room wearing the shirts, others who aren't wearing the shirts, so please do find out more. Yeah, Hi, on. my name is Kara, and I'm a senior in college. And we, as I'm sure everyone in the room knows, the loudest uh, the loudest activity you'll hear on college campuses with regards to Palestinian activism is BDS. 
And um, it's so rare that we get to hear the voices of actual Palestinian activists on the ground who are doing all sorts of different nonviolent work. And I'm just curious from your perspective, um, how does BDS fit in or not fit into the nonviolent uh, philosophy that you espouse? And um, how do you think that we should relate to it as allies of your work? Oh my God. <laughs> Um, well, you, you're, you're targeting this question um, in very painful time. You know, um, um, in J Street this year, there are around 25 uh, Palestinian speakers, and I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> and I'm not affiliated with any political party or political movement, and I'm just you know, peace educator, feminist who have, you know, big mouth and, and speak a lot. And um, the, the BDS movement, um, the Arab BDS movement, I have to say, because we researched that, um, have posted this statement about, about us. So I suddenly found, found myself with this blacklist of 25 uh, Palestinian speakers who are attending uh, J Street this year. And this is my first time facing, you know, m on my, you know, body and <laughs> feel this um, pain, you know. Um, um, and I, I know what I'm doing here. I know that uh, with any stage, with any audience, I will send the same message that I believe in. I'm not afraid of what's happening and with the BDS. And we choose as a, as a group to react after the conference, you know. And people wait for, for this opportunity to attack people who want to speak up or to, have, to send different messages and to be, um, to be heard in, in Arabic, in, in English, in Hebrew. And I wondered, for, for the BDS, I I am as a Samah, I live in Neve Shalom Wahdis Salam. So my, 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 my neighbors are Jewish. I, I am a Palestinian that have extended family in refugee camps in Syria. And they became refugees again because of the civil war in Syria in, in, in Germany and Holland and Sweden. And believe me, I know what is the Palestinian pain look like and what what price we paid for the Israeli occupation. And, you know, but I choose to act and to be there and to send this message of peace. And I, I sometimes, you know, when, when we speak against the BDS or sometimes, and there is definitely lots of things that I respect about the BDS. For example, we as a community, we don't uh, interact or host or support, of course, or buy anything related to the settlements. We are very aware political community, and we encourage people to uh, uh, consume, you know, wisely uh, everything related to the economy of the settlements with the regulations uh, of the BDS. I am with that, but. When someone come to my Facebook page and ask me to cancel my participation in this panel or in this conference, this is my freedom of speech that I want you and I want myself to advocate for. And I want to be heard. I can't be uh, you know, silent anymore. And I know that you know, the incitement and the passionate uh, BD BDS supporters can, you know, in some small battles can win. And, and I do admire a lot of achievements of the BDS movement, but with the Palestinians inside Israel, I think we have to act differently. And, and this is something that you, you should be aware of, you know. And I think that every activist, Jewish or Palestinian, American or Israeli, have the right to choose his way of resilience or resistance or, or you know, um, 
or speaking, you know, against the occupation. So this is really painful moment for us all. I I think that I won't regret that I didn't cancel my participation. I think that the price that might be paid, you know, in my political future, uh, um, I have to face that. I think that every activist or, you know, um, or professional or human, you know, who speak up or choose his choices or make his choices, if this is the price that I have to pay, I, I, will, I will be there. You know, I have to deal with my choices. In J Street this year, I choose to be here on this stage. And I believe that, you know, when I end this panel and leave this room, I will have followers, partners, supporters from the United States of America. I would like to bring combatants for peace into this room since you lost uh, a panelist uh, with Suli Khatib who couldn't get a visa to come to J Street this time around. And um, I, I'll, I would like to briefly describe who they are. They're, they are ex-fighters, uh, Israeli and Palestinian fighters who each came to the conclusion that what they were doing at some point in time was wrong and they put down their arms. Eventually they found each other, and about 15 years ago they started to talk to each other. That was an e enormous second breakthrough and transformation for them. Um, and they've been working together on the ground uh, in, in uh, the, the West Bank ever since. And I was wondering if you could speak in place of Suli a little bit about them and how you might work with them or cross paths with them. Or Susan, have you crossed paths with them? This was something that I was alluding to a little bit earlier in terms of there needs to be space for all of the different organizations to start working together. And that's where the synergy is going to happen. And this is where, in, in every one of these nonprofits or organizations that are working towards <laughs> peace and reconciliation and Nonviolence. everyone has their own value and vision, but we're all going to have to change in order to, to come together and create change. So everybody, we all have to give up something, and I think this is where bringing all the key players from Combatants for Peace, uh, Top Year, you know, every organization that is, many of the organizations that are represented here, we need to come together and say, okay, what can we all do collectively? So I would say that would be the place to start in, in working with Combatants for Peace. And I'm just so sad that Suli wasn't able to come today because I have great respect for him. And he's actually come to our school and spoken and um, Combatants for Peace has been represented. So. Um, I would have positive to things to say there, but I would add to that, that we all need to start working together. I, I hope you take up that mantle and lead the way. Thank That'd you. Be great. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Sama and to all 25 Palestinians who came here for coming and giving up what you are giving up to be here. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Susan, and I do some um, Middle East peace activist work in this country. Um, my question is, many of us go over, and I'll be going over to um, Israel, excuse me, in June, next June, on a trip. Um, when we go over for a 10-day ten ten day trip with our synagogues, with whoever we're going with, do you, is there anything you'd suggest as far as places to visit or things we can do when we're there, just there for a short time? This is a very easy question. To, um, <laughs> um, so um, you can visit Neve Shalom Wahd Salam. You know, uh, we have visitor center, 
and we we can arrange you a um, tour of you know very political uh, active community who choose to live in non-violent environment and to educate for peace in so many ways the primary school the first bilingual binational school based in the region and the school for peace we have 60,000 graduate uh, uh, people who are really involved in the human rights uh, movement and peace movement in Israel Palestine and we can also and the spiritual center I have to say the interfaith group because religion is not our enemy religion can be a, a tool for peacemakers and we have to speak to the people of faith and from the three Abrahamic religion and for people with people who do not believe in in any religion as well and we can um, you know you know I call it the political tourism you know we can arrange uh, a tour tour for people who want to understand more to people who want to you know um, to be active as a tourist and to learn about peace initiative to learn about the settlement about the apartheid wall to learn what is what's that mean to live under the occupation we can arrange that for you as well and and uh, to be wise you know some people and so a lot of Americans visit and come in the end of their tour to the village and says like we, we saw this wall and I'm not sure if they are in the set is settlement but but my cousin, he's a very, very good man, but this is cheaper to live in that settlement. So they're so confused. So uh, to be prepared for the, the reality, sometimes it's painful, but uh, to end the, your tour, any tour in Wahd Salam Nabi Shalom, it's 20 minutes from the airport. You will you know, pack in your suitcases a very small amount of hope. <laughs> And Susan, is that it? I'll be glad to give you a list of a number of people, but one organization, or uh, it's a family actually, Tent of Nations, and it's near Nevi Daniel. And um, Dawood Nasser and the whole family there, it's, their story is absolutely incredible. And it's a farm, they have all their legal papers all the way back to 1918, and there's five settlements around them, and the encroachment and the things that are happening to this family um, and they have this big, huge rock that says, we refuse to be enemies. And they have stories that will melt your heart. So Attentive Nations would be one of many. Breaking the silence, to, uh, you know, after the women initiatives as Not well. <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots of amazing things happening. And if you eat, just eat uh, good with Palestinian food. So <laughs> That's all right. I'll affirm that. Hi, um, my name is Rachel, and I'm an activist with If Not Now and Dope and Hillel, and, uh, which works for uh, pluralistic Jewish spaces on college campuses. And I wanted to ask a little further question about the BDS conversation. So I'm really sorry that you faced censorship with people uh, not wanting you to come to this conference because of the BDS movement. But I also want to name that a lot of censorship in the Jewish community is from the other side of the red line that exists from, uh, which is one of the reasons that I think many Palestinian activists aren't able to speak it like haven't been seen at this conference because when Palestinians uh, support boycott, divest, and sanction, many of them aren't allowed to speak or like on college campuses, they can't speak at Hillel's, uh, which censors many people and many perspectives of learning about the conflict. So I was wondering if you uh, have suggestions for how the Jewish community can push further into learning about the occupation when these red lines exist that prevent us from being able to critique Israel and how to uh, advance solidarity work with Palestinians? Uh, I don't believe in red lines. You know, uh, I, I, the only line that I know maybe on the ground is the green line, who we'll separate the occupation territories from the state of Israel. So if someone put a green line or you know red line for your activism and your ideology and your you know um, events, challenge that. As a woman, as a student, as you know um, activist who want to ask questions. So so I, if believe me, you know, if, if if we believe in red lines, we won't be here. You know so. So uh, I would challenge that. Um, myself, I, I was in Hillel Project two days ago in, in, in Stanford. So, so we speak, and if you, 
uh, you will always find partners who can meet you and, and listen to each other. And, uh, you know, there is, like, there is no black and white here. You know, you will always find people to listen to and to, um, to be, you know, to teach you or to educate themselves and you with this dialogue you know, between each other. So never, never give up. And um, I know if, if the BDS movement don't allow you to, you know, to bring people to speak to Hillel students, you, you will find another people. My, my you know, uh, idea or suggestion to you is to hear more than one voice. Like what Isa was trying to say, like, I can't meet Jewish guy in, in Times Square and say, this is the Jewish people, right? It's the same thing with, 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 with the Palestinians. You will find different voices, and, the, and this is normal. The diversity between the Palestinians is normal. You have to be accepted and respected and, uh, and welcomed, actually. Because we are different uh, people with different ideas that we all fight for freedom in different methods. So if you see that as a different tool of, of fighting the occupation, of fighting any kind of oppression against the Palestinian people, you will, you will become more toler tolerated and accepted of the, this diversity and this uh, uh, different, different tools of facing this ugly occupation. We're, oh, yes, we're a bit over time, so Susan, I was going to invite you if you have a few words that you want to add. Um, but otherwise, I think we should we should close for now. And I invite everyone to um, come speak to our panelists if you're able. Issa had to leave; Suli's not here. But also, can, in general, invite you to find these voices, find these stories. There are many, many stories of Palestinian nonviolent leaders Following pushing. Following nine seven two magazine and the Haaretz, I write yeah. a lot. And my next article will be about this conference, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, if there's one thing you want to add, but I think, and then we'll close. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to say, you know, a comment that, that Ali will often say is we are not about being pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, but much more pro solution and the goal is to build a Palestinian identity that is not against so just think about that for a little bit if, if we all grew up in a society where we are against what happens we lose our identity and I'm just going to close with one of the things that the Tahir team has shared with me so I said to them what is one thing that you would want me to communicate for you because they could not be here they could not get visas so they had asked me if I would represent them so I I joyfully said yes so um, there the visas are still in it's, oh okay um, the ongoing injustices we experience have yet to be resolved or healed and we know that nonviolence cannot ease our pain and anger. Instead, we channel them into positive actions that serve the common good and build trust with one another. We have a lot of anger at our disposal, but we refuse to hate anyone. We withdraw our cooperation from the paradigm of hate. We stand united with our nonviolent identity, committed to end injustice and overcome the legacy of unilateral actions that harm our vision. Anyone, anywhere who shares our values and acts on them will be considered our partner. We urge everyone to be pro-solution. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. By the way, Disturbing the Peace is a great movie about, the, the, it's a combatants for peace movie. It's great to show in a synagogue or in your home. <laughs> <laughs>